Pyre JS Conference. Here's Carmen. Stand by. All right. Hey, everyone. I need to mute my computer. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you today about this internet access talk. Internet access is something that is very close to my heart because I know how fleeting it can be. And once you don't have it, I know how difficult everyday activities can be. And it's not just being the only person in your office who hasn't seen Stranger Things or not having Facebook on your phone or being able to post that picture to Instagram. It's not just all of that. It's a real issue in somebody's life, and I've been really interested in how to fix this issue for a long time, which brought me to all of the things I'm going to talk to you about. So, like Jeremy said, I actually gave this talk in New York, and it was really wonderful to have people who are interested. I hope you guys are really interested as well about me. My name is Carmen. You can follow me on Twitter or check out my blog. I do write about connectivity a lot and also other JavaScripty things and sometimes .NET. So definitely check that out. And a uh, side note, uh, I mentioned before that my interest in this is kind of a personal interest. And I kind of want to stop here and let you guys know that I personally had to deal with not having internet for several years back around 2012, 2013, so kind of a long time ago, but at a time where to get a job you needed to be on the internet. And I actually learned a program out of a book around that time. So I can tell you from experience that learning to program without Stack Overflow is really, really hard. So just a little bit about me, and I'll kind of touch back on that throughout the talk. So did anybody not know that the internet is a big deal? So were you on the internet today, anybody? Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised that people aren't raising their hands, actually. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's unfair, right, because we're at a dev group, so of course all of us have been on the internet. But um, more than that, were you guys online this weekend? I, I, I'm, I know everybody was, like, raise your hands. Everybody, everybody was, because you're on Netflix, you're on social media, you're looking stuff up on Stack Overflow, anything. So it's, it's huge. And like I just mentioned, everything we do is online. And it's pretty amazing, actually, because we've seen these really great changes from the collaboration that being online gives us. And the internet is what we have to think for that. That's what enables this collaboration. We're able to communicate across the country, across the world, and you can do it over video, you can do it over text with Slack, you can do it over the phone. Really, any, any medium you want to use to communicate around the world, it's, it's available to you. And again, because of that, we've made some really massive strides. And just like a personal story, I used to be a nurse assistant. And I was a nurse assistant around, again, 2012. And that was when iPhones were, they had been out for a while, right? The first iPhone came out in 2007, but they were really expensive. You can get insurance on them. And so this was right around the time where they started becoming more widely available. The doctors that saw our patients had had iPhones for a while, and so they were already kind of used to being able to use apps to you know, help them with their jobs. The nurses, on the other hand, were, again, the phones were becoming widely available, so the nurses were able to get these phones. And you could really see this awesome shift between what used to be the way that the doctors and nurses would communicate real time, in person. Somebody needs something, it's going to have to wait. Maybe you can get the doctor on the phone, but maybe you can't. To this asynchronous communication where somebody is sick, somebody, like, something's going on. Oh, I'll just text the doctor. And, you know, maybe... 15 minutes, maybe a couple hours, but same day, you're getting results back from the doctor. And so this one particular story, I'll try not to bore you too much, but this one particular story, we had a lady who was ill and we thought it was pneumonia, but her doctor was out of town. And so that's where we're going to see this shift come in. We, again, we all thought it was pneumonia. The doctor was out of town. The nurse texted the doctor to say, hey, 
she's ill. This is also on a, like a Saturday or a Sunday, it's the weekend. So other doctors aren't really available either. We don't want her to get worse. We want to go ahead and get ahead of this. Text the doctor, the doctor agrees. Yeah, that sounds like pneumonia, let's order an x-ray. We're able to send her out for an x-ray. She comes back, yes, the, it is pneumonia. The x-ray is emailed to the doctor, confirmation, yes, it is pneumonia. He orders medication, all from his phone, by the way. He's out of town. So this is all happening same day. She gets the medicine that she needed. Like, this all started around 8 o'clock in the morning. By midnight, she was getting what she needed, which was amazing because we're talking about a situation that just a few years before, you know, maybe she would have had to have waited until Sunday. Maybe it would have been a situation where she ended up being sent out to the emergency room, which... If you're, if you're familiar with healthcare, you know like that is not what you want because there's a whole, there's a plethora of things you can get from being sent to the hospital. So it really improved her outcome. And that was a really long way to tell you how amazing this technology that we all use every day is. I'm sure you guys already knew that, but it's not just our industry, it's every industry. And while this is all really amazing, it does come at a price, right? To have internet in your home, you have to have a computer. You have to have a router and a modem in the service. For this story to work, you had to have a cell phone, which will double all that. So the price for internet in the United States runs anywhere from $50 a month for kind of low-end internet to 200 and above. And like I said, if you have a cell phone, that can be doubled. So all of that to lead into this question. If you aren't online, do you even exist? Like, where, where are you if you're not online? Can you search for work or keep up with current events or look at your bank data? Like, that's, that's a big one for me. I use, like, every day I'm like, what's my bank balance? But without a phone, can you, can you do that? Or communicate with your family or keep up with school? And the answer to these is pretty much no if you don't have internet in your home or internet on your phone because we have changed to where everything is online. And I've mentioned cell phones, so you might be thinking, well, cell phones probably help, right? Yes, they can help bridge the gap between having internet access and not having internet access, which is really what this talk is all about. But they can only help if you have the smartphone and if you have the data and if you have enough data. So again, there's these barriers that we run into. So I'll pause real quick and talk about inconsistent internet access, which is the phrase you're gonna hear me using throughout this talk. So no access, I'm sure you guys can infer, means you don't have any access, right? And that's true for some, but the studies that I referenced throughout this talk were for the United States, and that's not as common in the United States, having zero access. That's usually an infrastructure thing, and we don't see it as much here. So, and also, that's a lot harder problem to solve, right, when it's at an infrastructure level. The, the I don't want to say nice thing, but it's a bit easier to solve the problem of inconsistent access because we can use the techniques that I'm going to talk about in this talk to help bridge the gap versus never having any access. You've got to lay infrastructure. So inconsistent access, you guys can again probably infer. Sometimes you have access and sometimes you don't. But I wanna go a little bit further than that. So the people in our demographic are typically gonna be accessing via a cell phone, like we talked about. And maybe they have a computer at home, but maybe they don't. So if they do have a computer at home and they wanna access the internet, they're either gonna be tethering from their phone, which we all know if you're on a data cap may not be the thing you wanna do, or they're going to be going to a public place. So think like IHOP, Starbucks, places like that. So they have to get to the place, and then typically when you visit like a public establishment, you have to, you know, you're expected to buy something. So there's some, there's some barriers there. If they don't have a computer, they're gonna to have to go to a public place that does have a computer. So in that case, we're pretty much looking at libraries, which again, you have to get to, and you have to go when they're open. So again, there's some more barriers here. And I, I wanna just like illustrate real quick. How do you find a library if you don't have internet access? I don't know either, it's like a trick question. Exactly, but so just, just to illustrate. So now that we have a really good definition of what that inconsistent access looks like, we can take a dive into the numbers. 
So again, we've been talking about smartphones and access in tandem, because really they are in tandem. We're carrying the web around in our pocket. So the, excuse me, the driving force of the story I was telling you before with a patient with pneumonia was smartphones. And they give you this connection to the outside world. Like I mentioned, we're carrying the web around in our pocket. And smartphones are really ubiquitous. Actually, I would guess the study that I'm referencing here is a couple years old. So I would guess that these numbers are quite a bit higher now. And for many, like I was just talking about before, this is your smartphone is the only consistent internet access they have. So smartphone dependence. That means that we don't have access outside of our phone for the internet. Like we talked about, we've got 64% of Americans with smartphones and 12% are dependent upon them, so they don't. So that's about 40 million people. And so that's 40 million people checking their phones for stuff we mentioned before, like to check school, to check their bank balance, to look up a health issue. That was one of the most common things that people in this demographic use their phones for, was to look up a health issue. And that was very startling for me, I'll be honest. So. Limited opportunities. Limited opportunities means they don't have access to the public places. So that can mean that they're living in a rural area, or maybe they don't have good public transit to get there, or maybe they don't know where it is because they don't have the internet and they can't find it. But for whatever reason, they don't have access to those public places, but they do have a phone. And so for just, again, like population numbers, that's, about, that's a little more than 30 million people. Another definition can be no access at home. So maybe you have, your, you have your phone and maybe you have access to public places outside of your home, but you don't have it within your home, and that's 20 million people, roughly. And then our third definition is both. So we've got individuals who lack both internet at home and access to a public space for a variety of reasons, and that is about 14 million people. So in case you're wondering about what some of the reasons might be, the number one reason, it wasn't a huge surprise to me, I'll be honest, was money. Because you have to have money to pay for these things. It makes perfect sense. And then when we look at the other factors, there's a lot of overlap here because age is a predictor of income and also for our underrepresented minorities, there's a pretty well-documented wage gap. So. Again, we've talked about internet ranging from 50 to 200 a month, plus your hardware. It can just be difficult to justify, and even more, it can be out of reach. And the other side of this is that a lot of the people in our demographic are losing their access via their cell phones. And that leaves you unable to communicate, unable to search for work, or to research the health issues like we were talking about before, and other everyday searches. So the irony of the story I told you at the beginning about our, our patient who had pneumonia and the smartphone was the driving force to get her that really quick turnaround on her care, the irony of that story is that she was the benefactor of that technology, but the people who were her direct caregivers were the ones at the greatest risk of losing out on it because of their income, because they had to stop their plan due to cost, or they hit a data cap. And again, without access, you're basically in a silo. You can't really communicate with the outside world. So I've been kind of a Debbie Downer up until now, and I'm really sorry about that, but I just wanted to really let you guys know, like, this, this, these are not outliers. These are real people, and it's actually a pretty large swath of the population. But the great thing now is we can talk about how we can help. And what really stood out for me when I was doing all this research, it wasn't the fact that the access is tenuous or based on income and whether or not you can afford it. Uh, that didn't surprise me at all, honestly. <laughs> and if you're under the poverty line, which for Oklahoma is for a family of four hovering around 30, 30,000 a year, it makes a lot of sense that you can't spare upwards of $100 a month or more for internet. So that makes a lot of sense. What did strike me is the opportunity lost when people don't have access. These are people who need opportunity the most, I would argue, and yet they're the ones who are not able to access it.
So what can we do? The first thing we can do, and Electron makes this super easy. Sorry, John, it is a little bit of an Electron talk, I'm sorry. Uh, Electron makes this really easy to take your app offline. It, if you're not familiar with Electron, it's a JavaScript library that lets you port your app into it, and then you're serving the app off of the user's hard drive instead of via, via a web server. The other thing we can do is we can use event listeners to continuously check for a connection, and we can pull and save data only when we have that connection. And if we wanted to go even further, we could bundle, we could bundle a database. I reference SQLite, but there's other options. Bundle that database into the app, and then you're saving the user data locally, and you're foregoing database requests altogether. This one is probably the biggest one, right? Because all of that data I was showing you before was in conjunction with cell phones. And this demographic, they have cell phones, but you know, maybe they have a computer and maybe they don't. And there's how much good does a desktop app do when you don't even have a machine? So, but if you're looking at this list, you're probably gonna notice that those are pretty much the same ideas. We're checking for network connectivity and running updates when we're connected to Wi-Fi using local storage. The thing I really want to point out here is remember back when we were talking about people hitting data caps. So if you're on a data cap and you have an app that's continuously running and pulling the same information just so it can update, that's, that's not good if you're on a data cap and you're on limited income. So what we want to do is make those requests when we're on Wi-Fi or if it's an important one, go ahead and make it, but just like prioritize those requests wherever you can. And if it's possible to hard code more of your data into the app, but make the functionality smaller, that's a really good idea as well. So I mentioned at the very beginning how nice it would have been to have Stack Overflow when I was learning to program. And this right here, this isn't just for tech naturally, but I think it's it's easy may not be the right word. It's probably simplest to start in tech. Um, complete documents, please, please, please write complete tech documentation. And a really great example is the Electron docs. They are bundled into an Electron app that you download and they have real examples within the app because since it's an Electron app, they can show you like this is how the code, this is what you're gonna write and this is how it actually works. And you might be thinking that, man, I don't really like writing documentation and I don't really have a lot of time and you want me to make a whole new app for it? Man, that's crazy. Well, the really good news is it doesn't have to be a whole new app. It could literally just be a PDF document. The key here is that the user is gonna have it on their machine and they're gonna be able to reference it locally. And I've been talking this whole time about a demographic who is underrepresented and underprivileged, but I think it's really good to note here that all of these suggestions have value for everybody because everybody in this room at one point or another is going to lose their internet access. It doesn't have to be because you hit a data cap and you have to wait for your plan to start over. It could just be because your router went out on a Friday night and you can't get anyone out until Monday. It could be because you're traveling and like me, you don't want to pay for Wi-Fi. It could be anything. So I just want to note that all of these features, like they have value for everyone. So what if I can't take my app offline? And this is a completely reasonable question because a lot of apps like news, for example, is highly event driven and stores need their products to update in a timely manner so they can sell them. And even the story I told you at the very beginning required that it was asynchronous, but it was still real time. So does this mean that we can't possibly use Electron for these apps? It does not. We can, again, it's, it's less about going completely offline and more about prioritizing for your user what's gonna happen when they lose access. So again, we can use tools, Offline.js is one that allows you to stop your Ajax calls and then you can, it keeps a list of them and restarts them once there's a connection. 
And you can also utilize local storage to store data locally. And I touched on this a little bit before, but really like what I hope you get from this talk is just like consideration at the beginning of your app about what's going to happen when, not if, your user loses connection. Will they be able to keep working? I think most of your users are going to hope that that's true. Will, will there be an indication that the app is down, or will it just be an error page? I think most of your users are going to hope that is not the case. And so just asking these kinds of questions is what's really important. Ah, I think I went the wrong way. So my number one goal from this talk was to bring awareness to this issue, because when I've talked to people about this before, I've gotten a lot of surprise. When I was in New York, I had a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I hadn't thought about that before, but that's a really good point. And I was like, yes, it is a really good point. Please go home and think about this when you're building your apps. I was so happy. And I, I want to point out that this, this isn't just... I think sometimes there's an idea in our mind about what somebody might look like. I had people from the conference I was at come up to me and say, hey, this is affecting me. Thank you. So we might work with these people. We probably know these people somewhere. And so number one goal was to bring awareness to the issue. The next goal was to show you that we have the technology. We can solve the problem. Solve is a strong word. We can help mitigate the problem and ease the transition between having a connection and losing it and then coming back again. So again, the most important thing, if you leave knowing nothing else, know that Lack of internet access is a real problem, but it is a problem that we can help solve. So that ran a little quick, and I can open it up for questions. Any questions? Yes? So the question was um, if the libraries I'm referencing have a like a stopgap between having connection and when you've lost it. So offline JS has a good option where, like I mentioned, it keeps a cache of the calls that you would have run. And so if you've got your functionality built into your page, your page will keep running like normal. And so for instance, like if you are a new site and you're trying to run ads, it basically will just keep the ones that are there because they're cached. And then once you have connection again, it'll go ahead and restart where you left off. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so I was trying to come up with an example. Like, if you have a to-do app, you don't have connection, but you say, OK, I have a new task. Like, I guess you already have the data you need to render your entire list. Um, but then that means you have to your, your data local. Your data So the next one was like a to-do app example. And what can we do if we have our user has already added something to the list and then we need to sync it later once we have connection again? So in that example, I think that really comes back to planning when you're building your app. And so what I would recommend in that case is like you, like you had said actually, go ahead and like show the change to the user like locally and then you can use, I can show you after, I don't remember the name of the function, but it's built into the JavaScript spec, or you can use a library to check for connection. And so then once you've regained connection, you go ahead and upload the change, and you don't even have to re-render at that point. But if you did, they probably wouldn't notice. So that's personally what I would do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it sounds like those aren't exactly silver bullets dropped in. They have a plan. Exactly, yes. There's a lot of planning involved in offline apps. So what else, guys? Yes. I think, too, like, if you're someone like Peter Falk with JavaScript, instead of using electronic stuff, there's also uh, Ruby Motion, like the mobile apps, and that's not bad. There's also uh, a project called Ruby Shoes, I think, which also kind of accomplish some of the same stuff. 
So if you don't want to use JavaScript, which I don't know why you wouldn't want to use JavaScript, honestly, there are other non-JavaScript libraries that will allow you to build hybrid mobile apps and hybrid desktop apps, one of which is Ruby Motion for hybrid mobile apps, and then Ruby Shoes, is that? Mobile and desktop, okay. Okay, so Ruby shoes for desktop. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly. So um, you can use Chrome DevTools to simulate uh, different speeds in Wi-Fi. I think you can even go like 4G, 3G, and you can also go down to nothing just to see like, man, what would my site do? That's a really good way to check it out and see what would happen. So, all right, anything else? Yes. So when you have a data cap not using Wi-Fi, is that what you mean? Yeah, if you have an ISP like Cox is trying to artificially limit your data, not using Wi-Fi can be to your advantage. Yes, absolutely. So, all right. I think that's it, unless there's any more questions. Okay, thank you.